That was incredible. I drank half the ocean and almost threw up twice. That was completely worth it. So, as I promised you guys in part two, we will continue to shoot fish, cook fish, eat fish, <laughs> and we'll get to that dolphin footage as well. But first I have to address all the comments I got. You guys were curious how I keep my eardrums from blowing out, I'm gonna tell you. But before I get to that, I need to say, first and foremost, this is dangerous stuff. If you don't know what you're doing, you will wind up dead. And I know firsthand, because I've gotten close three times. And all three times, I was fortunate enough to have a diligent and very competent dive buddy near me who saved my life. I do want to note, I have not blacked out or even gotten close to blacking out since the birth of my children. Something changes up here when you start living for more than just yourself. But back to diving. As you drop down, the air in these little tubes between your neck and your ears, called eustachian tubes, starts to get squeezed because it undergoes pressure. As that air gets squeezed, it creates a vacuum in those tubes, which is sucking your eardrums in. My favorite way to equalize, and probably the most efficient and fastest way to equalize, is called the Fronsel technique. You take your tongue, slam it up against the roof of your mouth, jamming it forward to your teeth. From there, you would pinch your nose. Now, if you had a mask on, you're pinching your, your mask over your nose. <laughs> you hear me? <laughs> and with your tongue, you would piston the air that's trapped between your tongue and the roof of your mouth backward. Your nose right here should do this. If you can see that, you're doing it right. And you probably heard a tiny pop in your ears when you did that too. That's the Fronsel technique. And that's how you would keep your eardrums from blowing out as you go down underwater. So that takes care of your ears from popping out. There's one more thing to consider. Is that enclosed air in your mask also being compressed? When that air compresses in your mask, it forms a vacuum. It wants to suck something. What's it trying to suck? Your eyeballs out of your head. <laughs> what you have to do is give up small quantities of air through your nose to equalize the mask as well. And this is a lot to give up. Your lungs have to give up air to your station tubes and to your mask as you drop down. In addition, your lungs are being compressed, squeezed down. Every 10 meters of water is an atmosphere. So after 10 meters, your lungs are half the size they were at the surface. At 20 meters, your lungs are a third the size they were at the surface. And at 30 meters, they're a quarter the size they were at the surface. That can give you the sensation that you're being squeezed or suffocated, which can be a little bit disconcerting the first time you feel that, or the hundredth time you feel it. <laughs> All right, moving on. Okay, back to some purposeful diving, getting something to eat. There's a fish that has evaded me for many years, and that is the yellowtail snapper. I let off what was undoubtedly the best shot I had this entire trip. It was a long shot with a pole spear, and I knew I had to take a long one to get him, and man, everything just went perfect. I took him up the way I like, in butter, garlic, nothing else. Let the full flavor of the fish just come on through, and yellowtail snapper, oof, it's among the best. All right, now on to the business of diving with those dolphins. First, we have to find them. You drive your boat out to where you'd seen them in the past, throttle it down, drive slowly, put your head on a swivel, and keep your eyes sharp. But when we do finally see a dorsal fin, we throw out the tow lines, and towing behind the boat allows you to see a heck of a lot more looking down underwater than you ever could on the surface. The captain keeps things pretty easy at about five knots, but on occasion, if it's the first time we've seen him in a long time, yeah, he hits it so hard that he dang near rips your mask and suit off you. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't seem that fast when you're up in the boat. When you're, when you're down in the water, that drag is <laughs> pretty intense. And the first dolphin I see is one that I would later call <laughs> Little Stubby. <laughs> it would appear that this little guy got too close to a propeller at some point in time, but we'll get to him in a second. The thing that caught me off guard immediately was that you actually can hear the pops and clicks of these guys talking while you're underwater. I kind of thought that that was always captured by some special kind of super microphone, but you can hear it with your own ears. My little GoPro that's encased inside the plastic underwater housing is still able to pick up that audio. And these are Atlantic spotted dolphins. This is a different species than the bottlenose dolphins that we saw in part two of the Bahamas series. 
bottlenoses are much larger dolphin than these little spotted ones. And you'll notice that only some of the dolphins are spotted. The gray ones and the spotted ones are not a different species. As dolphins mature, they acquire more spots. So the more spots on them, the older the dolphin is. So all the dolphins are pretty friendly, but Stubby is particularly friendly. This little fella is like my shadow in the water. It was just, just awesome to have him swimming so close to me. You gotta remember these GoPro cameras are close, fisheye. They only need to be about two feet away from the dolphin to see the entire thing. So if you're, if they're so close that all you can see is like a portion of their head, it means that they're about two or three inches from the camera. Anyway, Stubby is in my hip pocket the whole time and I'm loving this. But eventually, another dolphin comes in and sh kind of aggressively shoos him away from me. And I'm no marine biologist, I'm no whale biologist, but I'm pretty sure I've seen this interaction before. <laughs> uh, animal behaviorists, if I'm wrong, go ahead and correct me, but I swear that they were scolding him, telling him, look, yo-yo, this is how you lost your dorsal fin in the first place. Now use your head and put a little distance, a little bit of discretion between you and the humans, huh? <laughs> Poor little stubby. He wasn't done though yet. He kept coming in closer, circling back to us uh, despite the reprimanding that they seemed to have gotten. And at one point in time, I'm swimming along with three larger adults and he even butts right in on me. <laughs> so when Simon and I got in the water with these guys, we were completely enamored, completely taken over by the moment. And next thing I know, about 20 or 30 minutes go by <laughs> Neither one of us has offered poor Connor a chance to get in the water. I recognize that the dolphins are starting to lose a little bit of interest in us. It's time to get Connor in the water before the opportunity is missed. Keep your fin ready, I'll take the boat over. Okay. He throws on a very unique fin called a lunacet. No it makes him look like a kind of a merman. Ready? <laughs> like Zoolander. Merman, Dad. Merman. Uh, that's probably completely lost on the majority of you. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I get behind the wheel and I chase down the dorsal fins and tell Connor, get in the water, let's go. But I recognized that I dropped him in a little bit behind them. They were kind of already on their way out. So I quickly tell Connor, you know, grab the tow line and I'll pull you over by them. But it turns out it wasn't needed. Grab the tow! One of these dolphins saw that crazy, crazy fin and he immediately set out chatter to the other guys. And man, when they see him, it is just a freaking beehive. They go crazy. And I'll shut up now so you can hear all this chatter. It's gotta be just something completely bizarre for them to see. Uh, an appendage that looks similar to what they have on an animal that has no business uh, having it. I got some good footage of that corner, man. Oh, man. That's the money shot. Incredible. You're right in the middle of it. Did you see they came in? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's all around you. They all came in, they wouldn't go. You know? That was incredible. Incredible. <laughs> and eventually they decided that they had other things to do and moved on without us which was just as well because we were freaking starving by now. <laughs> when you're in it, in the middle of it, the adrenaline's pumping so hard that you really don't take in just what a unique uh, opportunity it is to do something like this. But afterward, when you get up on the boat and you sober up a little bit, that's when it really hits you that you got to do something that most people, most humans, will never get a chance to do. You reflect on that and realize you know, just how, just how lucky you are to have been able to do something like this. So it's on to our last supper of the trip. We wanted to put some calories back in our guts. The meal to do that is fish hash. And the fish we target for this meal is the white margot. And karma kind of returns to me on this one. I mocked Simon in the last one for missing a fish and me having to clean up after his mess. Well, he does the same thing with this. Simon spots the fish that I tagged, goes down and puts his spear right down the center of him. Really good clean shot here. So we got one white margot, but that's not enough. We're going to need more fish. 
However, if you're not familiar with Murphy's first law of hunting, it states that whatever animal you're targeting is the only one you can't find. <laughs> we see these white margots all the time, hundreds of them on every trip. Yet when we want to put a few in the boat, we can't find them anywhere. So we decided to just tag a couple hogfish and maybe stir the hash a little more softly than we otherwise would. I tag this guy, get him to the surface, and by the time I'm looking back down on Simon, he's sticking his own. For good measure, we decided to put one more hog in the hash. This guy I hit good, he gives me that nice hearty crunch, but the flopper on the spear toggles and he comes off. But since I have a pole spear, the reload is really fast, and I don't even need to surface to get a breath for a second dive. He was hit so hard in that first shot though, he wasn't going anywhere. We're about to pack it in when I spot a couple coney grouper on the bottom. You can see me pointing it out here with my spear. And Connor makes a request that we take one of these home for his wife. So being the incredibly good Samaritan that I am, I decide to let Simon have the last fish of the trip. And not only do I let him have the final fish, but I follow him down and film him shooting it as well. Words truly cannot express what a kind and giving end of I can't even finish that sentence. <laughs> Simon is the last fish of the trip. We settle in here behind one of the keys, take a short breather, then get to making the fish hash. Okay, fish hash. Super simple, super delicious, super caloric. Cut up some potatoes, get them boiling, a little bit of sea salt. Chop up some bacon, some onions, and your fish. Cook the bacon down, but don't drain off the grease. You're going to use that to fry up the onions in the same pan. Drain the potatoes, add the raw fish, as well as the cooked up onion and bacon. Stir it all up, keep it on low heat. It only takes the fish a few minutes to cook. These small cubes of fish, it doesn't take long at all. Salt and pepper to taste, boom, there you go, fish hash. Okay guys, that will bring this one to an end. Ah, you can tell I'm very relaxed. We go home tomorrow, uh, the training definitely paid off. Those 2,000 miles really showed up out here in the ocean. I think I lost uh, the 10 to 12 I was expecting to lose. Uh, I do appreciate you watching. I'll see you at the next video.